Spider fans have another new movie to celebrate, and this time, it's the sequel to 2018's Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. If you've watched the first part, you probably have an idea as to what the makers have achieved in the sense of animated art, and even still, they have once again taken animation to a never-before-seen level. Trust me. So what techniques were used this time around in Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, as Miles travels across so many spider dimensions? How did the production team manage to weave together such a spectacular visual masterpiece? Welcome to Galore Techs, where we'll talk about the movie's tech and more in today's video, so you really should subscribe. Originally planned to be released in April 2022, the movie got delayed due to the pandemic, but we can positively say that it didn't hurt the franchise. Finally, after facing delays, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse production was completed just 13 days before it was released in the US on June 2nd. It has gained widespread acclaim from even the most critical of critics. At Rotten Tomatoes, the film got a whopping 96% positive reviews and an average rating of 8.7 out of 10, outperforming all other major Spider-Man movies. Against a production budget of $100 million, the movie has gained $247 million at the worldwide box office, becoming the 10th highest grossing movie of the year. Originally planned as a single movie, the visionary co-writers and producers Phil Lord and Christopher Miller realized that the tale they had in mind was simply too big to contain within a single movie, so they made the bold decision to split it into two parts. The next one, called Spider-Man Beyond the Spider-Verse, is scheduled to be released in 2024. Blocking in at a thrilling 140 minutes, this part manages to keep audiences captivated from start to finish. As Miles embarks on a journey across dimensions, the breathtaking animation and intricate storytelling weave a mesmerizing web that hooks viewers, ensuring that not a single moment feels dull. The creators have totally nailed it when it came to mixing up the animation styles. They went all out and used not just one, not two, but a whopping six different styles to bring the characters and locations to life. It's like they took a comic book, tossed it into a blender with vivid, high-class animation, and voila! This is because they wanted to keep that classic comic book feel, and they definitely succeeded. It's like watching a living, breathing comic book explode on the big screen. Although we don't have enough info about all of the tech, we can assume that they have used the Katana software and Arnold as their primary lighting and rendering tools for the project, like they did in the first movie. They have also used Mari high-resolution 3D painting software that helped to manage the details and layers within each of the channels and created a distinctive and beautiful animated feature. The visual effects supervisor, Danny Dimian, and the head of the character animation, Joshua Beveridge, say that for inspiration, they went back to the basics, which are the comics. They fell in love with the half-toning and hatching line work and brought both techniques into the animation to keep that comic book feel intact. Hatching involves drawing fine lines or strokes in a cross-hatched pattern to create shading and dimension. On the other hand, half-toning uses a series of dots or patterns of varying size and density to create the illusion of different shades and tones. The movie comes together as it's printed, and you can stop at any moment and see clearly what's happening, just like an illustration would. All the different universes that get visited in the movie were designed to look like they've been drawn by a different artist, something that no animated feature film has ever aspired to do before. During the production of Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, the team did something really cool with the animation by breaking free from the usual computer animation approach to add more dynamism and expressiveness to the movement. So, instead of sticking with the traditional animate by one technique where each frame is moved forward, they went for an animate in two method. Now you might say, what does that mean? Well, for every other frame, they either created a completely new drawing or scrolled the image to create a different effect. This gave them more control over the speed and intensity of the animation. The results were incredible. They could play with different rhythms, making the movements feel more alive and energetic. When Miles runs through the snowy forest, his speedy run is animated by one frame at a time. But when he stumbles and falls, his struggle to get back up is animated in two frames, emphasizing his fight against gravity. And those epic jumps between skyscrapers, they burst with a vibrant energy that wouldn't have been possible otherwise. It's these creative choices that make the animation truly stand out. 
Another thing that this movie has achieved is that here we see an amalgamation of 2D animation, 3D animation, and the traditional hand-drawn method, and computer-generated imaging combined. The crew created this technique for the last part, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, and this is the reason we see the frequent speech bubbles or colors bleeding into each other on purpose. The cinematographers didn't consider traditional motion blur, which naturally meant that they needed to solve the strobing issues caused by fast movement in other ways. So they adopted a blend of techniques like smearing the geometry, incorporating speed lines, and even employing multiple character limbs. In fact, the FX team introduced motion lines to swiftly moving objects, which not only diminished the strobing effects, but it also added an exhilarating sensation of velocity. At the start of the movie, we see Gwen Stacy's universe, Earth-65, which changes colors according to her emotions. That's why the producers have used the word mood ring for it. There's something called a show-don't-tell narrative, which means that instead of explaining or describing things through dialogue or narration, they visually depict them. They let animation speak for itself with all the color adjustments reflecting Gwen's emotions. Also, they really wanted to capture the essence of the Spider-Gwen comic book series from 2015. The animation style they used was like a mirror image of the incredible artwork by Jason Latour and Robbie Rodriguez. Although we see comic book style across the movie, it's more pronounced in Gwen's universe, and every frame looks like an impressionistic watercolor painting in pastel colors, indicating the detail the production team put into it, as if any scene can be used for a poster for the comics. Moving on. Spider-Man 2099 takes the spotlight as one of the main Spider-Man versions. They really dedicated a bunch of screen time to Miguel O'Hara and his epic adventure. Now here's the cool part. The animation style for Spider-Man 2099's universe is inspired by those awesome Sid Mead style illustrations that imagine what the future could look like. It totally fits the vibe of Spider-Man 2099's home Nueva York and captures that futuristic feel we often see in the comic books while still giving the city another dimension by drawing inspiration from Sid's work. Even Miguel's suit and powers got a makeover to match the style. And instead of the usual organic webs, this Spidey uses glowing web shooters that are tech-based. Now when the characters enter Mumbatan, the style changes to something that was inspired by the 70s comic books published in India. This universe, called Earth 5101, where Pavitar Prabhakar is Spider-Man, has another spin to it, which is that gravity is upside down there. The punky New London world of Earth 42, or Hobie Brown or Spider-Punk, looks more like it's hand-cut, pasted or drawn, and then glued together. This reminds us of punk rock posters from experimental artists. The jacket work by Spider-Punk was animated at a different frame rate from the rest of the character, which is a challenge in itself. And guess what? They pulled it off. The animation of Spider-Punk took two to three years by itself, and maybe that's why it's the most loved character among the public, with so many people praising the part on Twitter. Alright, fun fact. Did you know that the Lego universe in the movie was done by 14-year-old Preston Mutunga, who actually recreated a fan-made Lego version of the movie's first teaser? He was tracked down and recruited by the filmmakers to add his Lego sequence to the movie. Amazingly, this movie had around 1,000 Sony Pictures image works and Sony Pictures animation professionals working on it. So as they say, it takes a village to raise a child. It surely took a thousand professionals to bring together this cinematic masterpiece. Have you checked out this awesome animation yet? What do you think about the new Prowler? Tell us in the comments section. I hope you enjoyed the video, and remember to like, comment, and subscribe for more interesting Galore Text videos. Thanks for watching.